Hello everyone, I'm Wonsik Choi, working at the Center for Molecular Spectroscopy and Dynamics, Institute for Basic Science in Korea. It is my great pleasure to participate in this interferometric scattering microscopy conference. I believe that this conference aims to emphasize the importance of interferometric detection for imaging purposes. My group's research direction is getting along very well in this respect. In my group, we have been developing deep optical imaging method by exploiting the wave nature of the scattered light measured by the interferometry. In particular, we have made the deterministic use of multiple scattered waves for deep tissue imaging and efficient light energy delivery within biological tissues. This is the brief outline of my talk. I will first start with a brief motivation and then introduce the concept of transmission or reflection matrix. The use of these matrices for deep tissue imaging, light energy delivery, and near field imaging will be covered in sequence. As we all aware, the optical imaging has the combined benefits of high spatial resolution, good molecular contrast, and either minimally invasive or non-invasive. In fact, in the case of interferometric scattering microscope, the technique is completely non-invasive. However, its imaging depth is extremely shallow due to its susceptibility to multiple light scattering. For example, clean object image can be obscured by the speckle noise generated by multiple light scattering in biological tissues. We can appreciate the shallow imaging depth of optical imaging in this figure. In most of the high resolution microscopy, the depth at which diffraction limit is maintained is well below a millimeter. Our goal is to develop imaging modalities covering this area, which we call super depth optical imaging. In particular, we are interested in label free deep tissue imaging with subcellular spatial resolution. If we could have the microscopy that meets our interest, we may be able to realize early disease diagnosis. For example, we may be able to identify the enlargement of cell nucleus, the blue dots here, occurring at the early stage of cancer. This will be much earlier diagnosis than the current practice, which aims to detect malignant polyps somewhere around this period. Now I'm going to introduce the concept of transmission or reflection matrix. The scattering medium is more like a black box. Our approach is to record the input and output response of the scattering medium, including multiple light scattering. For this purpose, we prepare source channels, such as the position or equivalently the angle of illumination with specific wavelengths or timing of the pulses with specific polarization states. For each source channel, we measure the scattered wave in their amplitude and phase at all the possible detection channels. These measurements will constitute uh, a transmission matrix connecting the input and output field. Likewise, we detect the reflected wave at all the possible detection channels, and these measurements will constitute a reflection matrix connecting the input and the reflected wave. The reflection matrix is more valuable as it is applicable to in vivo applications. We will then make the deterministic use of multiple light scattering embedded in transmission or reflection matrix. This shows our exemplary system measuring the time-gated reflection matrix. The backbone of the setup is typical confocal or multiphoton microscope. The focused illumination is scanned at the sample plane by these galvanometer scanning mirrors. 
and the returning wave is measured through a pinhole. In the presence of scattering medium, there will be signal not only at the confocal points, but also at non-confocal points. Our setup is to record the phase and amplitude of all those scattered waves. For that purpose, we remove pinhole and PMT and placed a camera instead. And we introduced a reference wave to form an interference image at the camera. By using digital holography algorithm, we could obtain the phase and amplitude of the backscattered waves as a function of the position of the illuminations. By using an ultra short pulse laser, we can also record the time dependent response. These are the amplitude and phase images taken as we scan the focused illumination. Now these images are highly blurred due to the strong scattering and aberration. In the case of confocal imaging, only the points that coincide with the illumination are sampled. But in our case, we record all the signals around the confocal points. In this respect, we are taking more information than the conventional imaging. With all these measurements, we converted each of these illumination position dependent images into a column vector and constructed a matrix which we call a reflection matrix. As we used a low coherence light source, what we are taking is a time-gated reflection matrix. The diagonal elements of this matrix correspond to the confocal detection. And this is the confocal image reconstructed from the diagonal element. Due to multiple light scattering, there are pronounced off-diagonal elements, and our aim is to make use of these off-diagonal elements. From now on, I will talk about the use of matrix approach for deep tissue imaging. For a plane wave instant to a target embedded in the scattering medium, there exists a single scattered wave that is scattered only one time by the target object, but not at all by the intervening scattering medium. This single scattered wave is the signal of interest. The intensity of single scattered wave decays exponentially at the length scale of the scattering mean prepass. Here, factor 2 accounts for the round trip. Unfortunately, there exist multiple scattered waves that are returning at the same output angle, which means that you cannot reject them by the confocal gating. A large fraction of multiple scattered waves have the uh, different flight time so you can reject them by time gating. But some of them travel at the shallower depths and happen to have the same flight time as the single scattered wave. Therefore, they can't be filtered out even by the time gating. Then, uh, what will be the fundamental depth limit? Since single scattered wave should be detected in the first place, the fundamental imaging depth is set by the detector dynamic range. So the better the dynamic range is, we can achieve deeper imaging depths. But even if we detect single scattered wave, we need to distinguish it from multiple scattering. So the imaging depth is additionally set by the limit of confocal, temporal, and polarization gating, which we call gating limit. For thick scattering tissues, there exist severe sample-induced aberrations, which further reduce the imaging depths. We have been developing novel adaptive optics microscopy and new gating scheme to raise the imaging depths beyond the conventional limit. Ultimately, we would like to exploit multiple light scattering to go beyond the dynamic range limit. In our previous study, we developed a method to coherently accumulate single scattering in the presence of strong multiple scattering noise. We termed this method as a CAS microscope. 
We then developed a method termed a class microscope, which stands for the closed loop accumulation of single scattering, to correct the sample induced aberrations even in the presence of strong multiple scattering noise. From the measured matrix in the space domain, we convert its basis to the wave vector space by means of Fourier transform. We then computationally apply the aberration correction for the input and output basis in such a way to maximize the diagonal element in the space domain matrix. In other words, we refocus the off-diagonal elements back to the diagonal element. Then the reconstructed image from the diagonal elements become very sharp. And these are the input and output aberrations identified by our algorithm. Note that this is not a simulation result, but an experimental result. From now on, I will briefly explain the working principle of CAS and CLASS microscopy. In the absence of scattering and aberration, the angular distribution of the reflected wave is rotated as we rotate the illumination angle. Mathematically, the reflected field is given by the multiplication of object function and incident planar wave. The object function can be written as the integral of object spectrum. By taking Fourier transform with respect to R out, we can get an angular spectrum, which is the object spectrum shifted by the incident wave vector Ki. Now let's consider two columns in the k-space reflection matrix, one of which uh, has the incident wave vector KL and the other uh, with KM. Then the output spectra are given as follows. Here the first term is the single scattered wave and the second term is multiple scattering noise. Gamma indicates the intensity of the single scattered wave attenuated exponentially. And beta indicates the intensity of time-gated multiple scattered wave. Now, if we compensate the spectral shift uh, of the reflected wave by the incident wave vector, the single scattered wave become identical, while the multiple scattered wave stays uncorrelated with respect to each other. So what we can do is to sum all the columns in their electric field after proper spectral shift. Then the single scattered wave grows in proportional to the number of illumination angle. As a consequence, the intensity of the reconstructed image, uh, the single scattering components is proportional to n square, while the multiple scattering is proportional to n. So because of this, both uh, signal to background ratio and signal to noise ratio are proportional to n. This is a meaningful gain with respect to the conventional incoherent addition where SNR gains with the square root of n. This is the working principle of CAS microscope. In our earlier study, we demonstrated a diffraction limited image up to the depths of 11.5 scattering mean prepass with the spatial resolution of 1.2 micron. Now let's consider the case when there exists both scattering and aberration. Then the single scattered wave experience phase retardation on the way in, and also the phase retardation on the way out. The back scattered wave is now modified as follows. Here, uh, the input aberration is embedded in PIA and the output aberration is embedded in P out A. And PK is the ideal pupil function of the objective lens, which is unity within the numerical aperture and zero otherwise. Here the difficulty arises because 
we need to identify one-way aberrations from the round-trip measurement. Now let's consider two different columns again. Let's ignore multiple scattered waves for now. With the proper spectral shift, the angular spectra of the two columns become proportional to the object function. But here we have input and output aberrations. Suppose there is no output aberrations. Then the cross correlation between these two columns give us the input aberration. But the presence of output aberrations give rise to complications. The cross correlation of the output aberrations add phase error delta phi. When the difference between KL and KM are small enough, then the output aberrations between these two columns are rather similar, then delta phi is not random but finite near zero. As a consequence, the phase of the cross correlation is close to the input aberrations. Note that the phase of the object function the didn't or doesn't contribute to noise delta phi because only its absolute square participate in the cross correlation. So operationally, we compute the relative phase between columns after the proper spectral shift to preferably find the input aberrations. This is equivalent to shaping the illumination wave. Then the reconstructed object image becomes sharper. But the correction is not perfect due to delta phi induced by the output aberration. Now, we considered an ind independent operation to preferably correct the output aberrations. With the input correction in place, uh, we now calculate the cross correlation among the rows of the reflection matrix. Then this is approximately the output aberrations. Because input aberration was partly corrected in the previous step, the error is smaller. Therefore, the image becomes sharper than the previous round. This process is equivalent to shaping the incident wave uh, in the phase conjugation process. We iterated these input and output corrections until the relative phase between the columns converged to zero. As a consequence, the spatial resolution of reconstructed image is enhanced to the diffraction limit, and the total intensity of the reconstructed image is increased. This is mainly due to the proper accumulation of single scattered wave with the help of the aberration correction. This point is made clear when we observe the origin of the total signal increase. Multiple scattered wave is initially much uh, stronger than the single scattered wave, but stayed about the same level uh, even with the iteration. The aberration correction doesn't affect much to the multiple scattered waves because multiple scattered waves were completely uncorrelated in the first place and stays as such, even with the addition of the correction phase. On the other hand, single scattered wave was greatly increased due to the constructive interference after the aberration correction. With the class microscopy, we demonstrated imaging of the central nervous system of a living zebra fish. This is a 3D rendered image that we obtained, and these are the images from surface to the depth. Note that all these structures are obtained not by the fluorescence staining, but they are label-free reflectance imaging. The main structure that we are looking at here are myelinated axons. We streamlined our instrument and demonstrated the first label-free imaging through the intact skull of a living mouse. 
we first tested with the ex vivo sample. This is a conventional OCM image, and this is a class image. Since the aberrations were so severe, the aberration maps were different from position to position. We also realized in vivo imaging of a living mouse. Once again, this is an OCM image and this is a class image. We could also physically correct the aberrations by using a spatial light modulator in the excitation and detection beam pass. By displaying the negative of the aberration maps identified by the class algorithm, we could recover a sharp focus at the camera from the initially uh, blurry point spread function. Once the SLM correction was in place, we could obtain a sharp confocal image without the need for class algorithm. This graph shows the increase of the peak intensity of the PSF after computational correction and hardware correction in comparison with the conventional OCM. To further increase the imaging depth, we need to devise a new gating scheme. For that purpose, we developed a method called a space-gated microscope. In this method, we introduce an acoustic focus at the optical focus and selectively detect the acoustically modulated optical wave by using a frequency-shifted reference wave. Then the multiple scattered wave traveling outside of the acoustic focus was rejected. With this new gating method, the optical focus could be recovered at the condition where the conventional confocal imaging didn't work. We performed ex vivo imaging of a relatively matured zebra fish and visualized the muscular structures invisible to the conventional confocal imaging. Now I will talk about the way to send waves efficiently to targets embedded within scattering medium. Efficient light energy delivery within living tissues is critical for biosensing and light therapy. In our earlier study, we experimentally demonstrated that a specific pattern of illuminations called eigen channels can have a better transmittance than the other. Physically, these patterns induce constructive interference on the transmission side of the scattering medium. Let us briefly explain how to find these eigen channels. We first recorded a transmission matrix and applied a singular value decomposition. Then the matrix can be decomposed into U, Tau, and V, where U and V are unitary matrices containing the output eigen channels and input eigen channels, respectively, and Tau is the diagonal matrix containing the eigen values. And the meaning of the eigen value is the amplitude transmittance of the associated eigen channel. This graph shows the exemplary uh, eigenvalue distribution. If we choose an eigenvector with a large eigenvalue, and if we could couple light into this eigenchannel, then we can increase the energy delivery through the scattering medium beyond the average transmittance. However, this transmission study is not compatible with in vivo applications because we cannot place a detector on the opposite side of the scattering layer. We need to devise a way to efficiently send light energy to a target embedded within scattering medium. For that purpose, we investigated the temporal response of the backscattered waves. Without target, we have this kind of backscattering intensity as a function of time. When there exists a target, 
there is a slight increase of a signal on and after time t0. Here t0 is the minimum travel time to the target. If we can enhance the intensity at this flight time t0, then the light energy travel to the target is expected to increase. We performed a numerical simulation to verify this idea. We calculated a reflection matrix at time t0 by using the finite difference time domain method and identified the eigen channel at time t0 using singular value decomposition. By coupling light to the eigen channel with the largest eigen value, we could enhance the backscattering intensity at time t0. We compared the internal field distribution between the random input and the eigen channel coupling and observed that light wave is focused to the target and light energy delivery is enhanced by A times in the case of eigen channel coupling. We experimentally demonstrated this concept for a silver disk uh, located behind a scattering layer. We experimentally measured time-gated reflection matrix and identified eigen channels. We observed that the reflection intensity at the target flight time is greatly increased when the uh, field is coupled to the eigen channel. And when we observe uh, from the transmission side, the target appears to be bright, which means that waves are now focused onto the target. Finally, I am going to talk about the application of matrix approach to the near-field image. We demonstrated the delivery of far-field image to the surface plasmon polariton. For the thin metal film with the disordered array of nanoholes, we projected a flower pattern. Then the nanoholes converted this far field into SPPs. However, the generated SPPs look like a speckle pattern because the disordered array of nanoholes act as a scattering medium. By measuring the transmission matrix between far field input to SPP output and by multiplying its inverse to the surface plasmon field measured uh, from the outside, we could obtain the original far field image. This study proved that the transmission matrix approach along with the use of disordered nanostructures can resolve the dimensional reduction problem. In our demonstration, far field information conveyed in a two-dimensional cross-section is fully delivered to the surface wave on a chip sampled along one-dimensional cross-section. Recently, we combined the transmission matrix approach with near-field scanning optical microscopy and recorded far-field to near-field transmission matrix. We imaged a double-slit nanostructure with the slit gap of 50 nanometer. Since this was smaller than the diameter of Enson probe aperture, which was 150 nanometer, the conventional Enson cannot resolve the two slits. We measured the phase and amplitude of near field at the surface of the double slit for various angles of far field illumination. By merging all the near-field images into a matrix whose column index is the illumination angle and row index is the position at the sample surface, we then performed the singular value decomposition of the matrix and identified the eigenmodes of the near-field embedded in U. These are the eigenvalue distributions. We could observe various higher order eigenmodes, such as the anti-symmetric mode, which are invisible to conventional Enson images. So far, we have used single scattered wave for image reconstruction in the case of deep tissue imaging. 
But theoretically, this kind of wave that are scattered twice can also be used for image formation. To realize this, we need to figure out how this scattering event in the middle of the scattering medium modifies the backscattered wave. This requires the addressing of the higher order inverse problem. And the best information is contained in the reflection matrix. The question is how to extract it. If we can solve this higher order inverse problem and make the deterministic use of multiple scattered waves, we may be able to go beyond the dynamic range limit while maintaining the spatial resolution. In summary, our group has been addressing one of the most challenging yet extremely beneficial goals in optical imaging, that is to enhance its imaging depth. We have made the deterministic and microscopic treatment of multiple light scattering based on either transmission or reflection metrics of a scattering medium. We have access to super depth optical imaging and efficient light energy delivery relying on either elastic or inelastic light scattering process. Application studies have been conducted for in vivo mapping of nervous system, early medical diagnosis, and so on. I would like to thank to all our group members for their hard work and creativity. And the contribution of our former members is very much appreciated. We have diverse range of collaborators within our university and Korean biomedical optics community. For more information, please visit our website. My group is supported by the sizable funding from the Institute for Basic Science program. For more information, uh, visit the website of the IBS and our center. Thank you for your attention.